You know, this morning's scripture is actually a very well-known piece of scripture. Right? I'm pretty sure all of us in this room or the majority of us in this room are familiar with this particular passage because it's when Jesus walks on the water. And Jesus walking on water is significant, right? Significant for us, uh, significant for the disciples because it reveals to us, right, in this miraculous event that Jesus is who he says he is. He is, in fact, one with God, right? And while we know Jesus and we know him for who he is, this morning what I like to do, I like to focus on the chaos that occurs in this moment, Right, how Jesus being present is important. And how Peter and the other disciples respond. Right, because we, I think we for without doubt, we know who Jesus is. Right, he is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. He is the one who saves. We know that. Right, but as we live this Christian life, as we are living this life for Jesus, how can today's scripture speak to us in a way that meets us where we are? encourages us and readies us to go back out into the world. I hope that makes sense. You see, when it comes to serving, when it comes to stepping out of your comfort zone, when it comes to being used by God, I think a lot of times we have the right intention. Like we mean well. Right? We have the right motivation, right? We, we, wanna, we wanna live for Jesus, right? We have the desire, right? The desire is there. But when it comes time to actually stepping up, when it comes to actually stepping forward, what happens? We become stagnant. Like we, we, we want to step forward in faith. Like we want to move. We want to be used by God. We want to do things for the kingdom of God. We want to have an impact. We want to cause ripples, right, in the kingdom of God. But when it actually comes time for us to step forward and to be used by God, I don't want to say we freeze, but we aren't so quick to rise to the occasion. Like we say it, but then when it actually comes time for us to put our money where our mouth is, like we become hesitant. Why is that? Why are we like that? You see, for some of us, it might not feel like, I don't know, the right time or the, the right season to, to step out and, and to serve God and to be used by him. Right, for some of us, right, it might, right, it might not be right now because, you know, we're just, our life is, is just filled with distractions upon distractions. So it would be really tough for us to give God the commitment he deserves when it comes to serving him and his church. I think for some of us, the idea of serving or even, even having like somewhat of a spotlight being shone on us might cause some anxiety. Like, it just freaks you out. Like, you don't, you don't want that pressure. Maybe you don't want that attention. Right? Maybe you just want to work in, in, in the shadows. Maybe you want to move like lasagna. Right? The G is silent. But I think the number one reason, right, the number one reason, like, if this were family feud and the number one, right, answer on the board would be, it would be what? Survey says, Fear. The number one reason why you and I, even though we confess Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, even though we, can set, uh, we confess to be saved, even though we claim to be walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, living for Jesus, the number one reason why you and I might not move forward, the number one reason why we might not respond to the calling that Jesus is placing on our lives is what? It's fear. And it's okay if you disagree with me. But from my perspective and from my experience, right, not looking at you guys, right, not, not up here, I'm not, I'm not looking at, and just going, yep, yep, no, that's not what I'm saying, right? But what I mean is that it's just the people I've talked to, the people I've had heart-to-hearts with, the number one reason is fear. Fear holds us back. Fear prevents us from stepping forward. And if we're honest with ourselves, fear makes us feel like we're okay with where I am. Like, God, I'm, I'm good right here. Where I'm at right now is, is fine. Like, no, 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 like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want that unknown. Like, no, thank you. 
how about we just hang out right here for a moment? Right, fear makes us okay with where we are, right? There is so much we would like to do for God and for his purpose. But fear has this tendency to keep us at bay, keep us where we're at. And that should not be the case. Would you agree with me? My fear should not be the number one thing that prevents us from stepping forward. Fear should not be the number one thing that holds us back or keeps us comfortable. Not comfortable because, man, life's good, but comfortable because I don't want things to be shaken up. I don't want the unpredictable to happen. I like knowing how things are going to unfold. This morning in our scripture, we have the disciples who are on the Sea of Galilee. And they're, they're rowing the boat. right? Jesus, right? They've, they've been rowing the boat. They're rowing the boat to the other side. And scripture kind of reveals to us that man, like they've, they've been rowing for what seems like hours. right? And, and we don't know when they left, but it's safe to assume they've been traveling throughout the night. right? They got, they got to move when everyone is inside their home because Jesus has attracted this crowd, they're anxious to see what Jesus is going to do next. You see, even, even our scripture takes place at the fourth watch of the night, which in our time would be an estimation between the hours of 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And so not only is it late, more than likely, like these, these people who have been walking with Jesus, serving Jesus, learning from Jesus, right, the disciples, they are tired. I would imagine that they are sleep-deprived, Right, and that, that high of Jesus feeding the masses, which just happened the day before, like mentally, is exhausting. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever been sleep deprived and there's been so much going on in your life, are you in the right state of mind? Like, are you functioning well? Probably not. You're probably agitated. You're probably lacking some patience. You're not, you're not seeing things clearly. You're frustrated. You don't want anybody to bother you. And I imagine for the disciples, that's kind of what they're going, going through, right? They're a mess. Like, despite how good God has been over, over the past, like, you know, the season that they've been walking with, because they, they witnessed some things. And they're amazed by who Jesus is. But to make matters worse, there's a storm. There's a storm, and they're scared to the point where they're seeing ghosts. Right? They are terrified. The thing about the Sea of Galilee that you and I need to understand is that the Sea of Galilee is actually 682 feet below sea level. And that may not make sense to you, but hopefully it makes sense because I did my research. I'm not Steve Poole by any means, right? I'm no oceanographer or anything like that. So I trust what the people have studied. But the Sea of Galilee is 682 feet below sea level. and the west of the sea, there is a valley. And from the valley, from the valley what happens is that it brings in warm air. Like, breathe, like gusts of wind, like warm air is coming. And the Sea of Galilee being as low as it is, has what? Has cold air. And so what happens when the warm air comes and the cold air, they collide? What happens? It, it brews up the storm and it causes things to get wild. And so it's not like, it's not like the, people, the disciples on the boat, like they just met with these little baby waves. Right? It's not like from the stories I heard of you guys who go deep sea fishing and that you say you went fishing but you were just throwing up the whole entire time. Right? No names mentioned, but I heard some stories. All right? yeah, all the wives are laughing right? because they know who, who I'm talking about. But this is serious. Because not only is there a storm brewing, the boat could capsize. The boat could be swallowed up by the waves. And it, things look uncertain. And so it's understandable why they are not just scared, terrified. But they are scared for good reason. And we have to remember that some of the disciples what, were what before they followed Jesus? They're fishermen. They're familiar with these waters. They know just how serious the situation is. They know exactly what they're against. And what happens? Jesus shows up. He doesn't arrive on another boat, right? Jesus shows up walking on not just water, but the raging sea. It's not like Jesus is walking across this, this plain, calm, still water, right? The wind is crazy, and Jesus is 
nonchalantly just showing up, right? And that's where we see things kind of unfold. Not only is it Jesus showing up that's promising, it is a presence of Jesus that is calming, that brings about security, which we will see a little later. It is the presence of Jesus that brings about a confidence just in his, in his speaking, right, that turns their, their terror into worship. And that's kind of what I love about our passage this morning. That in the midst of chaos, the end result is worship. And so I hope you guys can see that, all right? And that's where we want to be, right? We want to come to a place where Jesus can meet us in our most terrified moments. We want to come to a place where Jesus can speak some sense into us, where Jesus can uh, create peace in the midst of the chaos, right? where Jesus can turn those moments where we should panic, when the rest of the world might panic, right? and rightfully so, because they don't know Jesus, but because we know Jesus, that the chaos will turn into worship. So there's four bullet points uh, I would like for us to consider this morning in light of our scripture today. The first one is this, right? In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the storm of your life, in the midst of all the chaos that is taking place, know who is commanding you, right? Know who is speaking to you. Know who is, uh, who is communicating to you from a place of authority. You see, in verse 28, we see Peter respond right, in faith. Right? It doesn't say that, but we see Peter. Everyone else is in the boat. They're, they're terrified. And then Jesus approaches them on the water. And it is Peter who steps up, who rises to the occasion. And he is stepping out in a place of faith. He is responding in faith because I believe, right, Peter being the rock right, that Jesus would build his church on, he saw things a little differently. Right? Peter responds in faith in the midst of fear and panic. In verse 28, he says what? He says, Lord, if it's you, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And so essentially what Peter is implying is that, Lord, if it's you, meaning the one who just multiplied the loaves and the fish, right? If, if that's you, right? If, if, if that's the one speaking to us, like, Lord, if it's you, the one who heals. Because remember, they've witnessed Jesus do what? Heal. Heal the sick. Heal the lame. Heal the paralytic. He's saying, Lord, if it's you, the one who, who has the power, the authority to cast out demons with just your voice, Lord, if it is you, if it is you, the one who has come to save, Lord, if that's the one you are referring to, if that is you, the one who is before my very own eyes in the midst of all this chaos and unknown, Command me to come to you on the water. Know who is commanding you. Know who is giving you orders in your life. You see, the Greek word for command here is kaleo. And kaleo means to command or to give an order. And so what Peter is doing here, he is asking Jesus to give him a direct order. Not as a man but as God. Or he is asking God to give him an authoritative order, but it's not as Jesus, this great teacher who has a plethora of knowledge. He's asking from a place that is a confessing. Like if you are the God who has come to save, command me to get up out of this boat. Know who is commanding you. Right, Peter is saying, Jesus, tell me, uh, to do what you're doing. And what is that? What is Jesus doing? Walking on water. Like, we make light of this situation, but to be honest, like, this is an unimaginable, unthinkable situation. Everyone on the, everyone else on the boat is terrified. Their lives are in danger. And yet, Peter has the audacity to say, hey, Jesus, can you invite me out onto not the calmness of this water, but into the midst of this storm, this very water that you're walking on? Help me to confront it. Help me to encounter it. Help me to come to you in the midst of all the things that are taking place. 
You see, the, the magnitude of risk, the magnitude of danger is nothing to take lightly. And yet, and yet, Peter is drawn to Jesus and seeks, I don't know, comfort and reassurance that they are in the presence of the Holy One. Why is that so important? Know who is commanding you. With the steps that you are taking forward and the things that you're doing, the things that you are asking, do you ask them knowing that you are in the presence of the Holy One? Do you ask them knowing that you are in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world? You see, the same event is recorded in the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John emphasizes who Jesus is. Right? In John chapter 6, verse 20, it says, But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. The very same thing that Jesus says here. But the Gospel of John just leaves it at that. Because that's all he wants to portray is that know who Jesus is. Know who you are in the presence of when the chaos of life is coming your way. Right? Know who is commanding you. You see, when you know who is commanding you, when you know who is speaking truth into your life, who, who is speaking life into your existence, you and I, we have no reason to fear. And what's the number one reason why we don't move forward? What's the number one thing that just holds us back? It is what? It is fear. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Why are some of you, why are some of us so scared? Right? Some of you, you scared, right? Come following Jesus. You're so scared. And it shouldn't be that way. Especially if you know who you are in the presence of. When you read the word of God, do you know who is commanding you? When you're studying the scriptures, do you know who is speaking to you? Do you know who is commanding you? Because if you do, why are you so afraid. You see, when you've been following God and troubles or, or danger comes your way, remember who is commanding you. Remember who has commanded you. Because when it is Jesus who is with us, we have no reason to be afraid. When it comes, when it is Jesus who is giving us the command, we can find assurance and security in that. Because it is Jesus, the I am, it is I, we have nothing to fear. Nothing whatsoever. The second thing is this. If you want to walk on the water, guess what? You got to step out the boat. If you want to walk on water, you got to step out from the boat. You see, we see Jesus respond, and Jesus' response is all the confidence that Peter needs. In verse 29, what does Jesus say? How does Jesus answer Peter's question? How does Jesus answer Peter's request? He simply says what? Come. Ora. Right? Korean sounds a little more serious, right? Ora. Come. Right? And that's all Peter needs to hear. He doesn't need an explanation. He doesn't need a, you know, expository sermon. He doesn't need a Bible study. He doesn't need a thesis. Simply, Jesus says, come. And what does he do? He gets out from the boat, walks on water toward Jesus, doing the unimaginable, doing the unthinkable, doing what we think is impossible. It probably still is, right? You see, a lot of times we want to do things for God. I believe so. Like, I, I believe with all my heart that, you know, Christians, right, people who confess Jesus Christ as their, their Lord and Savior, like you desire in your heart, you have this inclination that you want to step forward, you want to move, you want to do things for the kingdom of God, you want to be used by God and for his glory, you want to experience amazing things for the kingdom of God, not that you want the glory, but because you want God to receive the glory, like you want people to come to know who Jesus Christ is, and like you know that you have talents, you know that you have gifts, you know that you have worth and value, yet when it comes time to stepping forward, like, I'm, I'm good in the boat, man. No, thank you. But we need to be 
like Peter. Like we just need to be like, God, if, if, if you want me to do this, like God, I feel like you're, you're leading me into this, this direction. Like God, if that is you, just give me confirmation and I'll do it. God, just speak to me. Give me that reassurance and I'll do it. And you don't need a, a, a sermon. You don't need a lengthy explanation. All you need to hear is that confirmation from God saying, come. Or in other cases, Jesus might just be saying what? Go. And go. And don't look back. But when Jesus says go, or when Jesus says come, how will you respond? You, you want to walk on like you want to walk on water, but you're still in the boat. You want to be used for the kingdom of God, yet you don't want to get up from your seat. You want to be used by God, but you don't want the comfort of your current lifestyle, your situation to be shaken up a bit. How can you walk on water if you're chilling on the boat? And the funny thing about this is that this boat is about to what? I'm about to sink, man. And yet they're like going crazy. And yet Peter's like, man, God, I know you're the only one that can save me in this situation. So all you have to do is say, come, and I'm going to go. I'm going to respond. We need to step out of our fear. We need to step out of our anxiety. We need to step out from wherever we are. But this is the key. We have to do so. We have to respond with our faith placed where? In Jesus. So if, if, if God says come like with your faith in Jesus, you go, you, you, you respond. Right? Where, wherever we are with your faith placed in Jesus, we have to move forward. We have to move toward possibly doing what we might think is unimaginable, the unthinkable. Right? It doesn't have to be this miraculous thing of, as, as like walking on, on water. When Jesus says go, when Jesus says come, when, when Jesus said let's do it, let's rock, let's roll, we must respond by trusting Jesus and his words. You see, it's Peter's faith in Jesus that in the middle of a storm with the waves crashing, the boat being swayed, that his faith is in the one who says, come. Right? His faith is being placed in the one who says, it is I. And that in that moment, all of the chaos didn't matter. I need you guys to understand that this morning. It's crazy right now. But for Peter, in that moment, it didn't matter. Right? Because in that moment, the only thing that Peter is concerned about is what? Who is before his very own eyes, who is speaking to him, who is commanding him to come. Because in that moment, trusting Jesus mattered most. Like, I must say that again. In the chaos... In the uncertainty of life, in the midst of fear and anxiety, in the midst of being terrified, like being this close to pooping your pants. Like, I need you to understand this. What mattered most to Peter? It was trusting Jesus. It was trusting Jesus. I would imagine for Peter, because he was trusting Jesus in that very moment, it felt like time stopped all that mattered was the faith that he had in the very one who is commanding him to come forward you want to walk on water but you don't even want to get out the boat you want to be used by God but it has to be on your terms right? you want to do things for the kingdom of God but only when it is convenient to you but here we have Jesus approaching them in the midst of the storm, probably in a life-threatening moment, the most terrified they've ever been in their life. And yet, Peter has the audacity to respond in what? In faith. Don't you want to be like Peter? We, we should have a heart, we should have a faith that just resembles that of Peter. 
Or even think of Abraham, right, who is the what? The father of faith. Think of the example he set from the very moment he responded to God calling him to leave everything that he knew and journeying to the unknown. You see, the author of Hebrews recalls Abraham's example of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, saying, it was by, by what? Say it with me. It was by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed. It was in faith that when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him an inheritance, he went knowing everything, right? No, it says that he went without knowing where he was going. Because all that mattered in the midst of the unknown, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the storm, trusting Jesus meant everything. Trusting God who is sovereign over all things meant everything. It was enough to leave everything comfortable and to step out into the unknown. You, you want to walk on water. But you don't even want to put your toe in the sea. You, you check in the temperature. And if we want to follow God, if we want to be used for his kingdom, that cannot be the case. Because when God calls you, trust me, he is. He is. And he will continue to do so as long as you're vertical, right, as some of you older gentlemen like to say. As long as you are vertical, God is going to continuously call you to use you for his kingdom. But when he, do, when he does, how will you respond? Are you ready to take chances? Come on. Are you ready to take chances for the kingdom of God? Come on. We want, we want to be used, but we, we, we got so many complaints. We got so many contingencies. We need to be like Peter and simply just have a faith that says, all right, God, let's see what's up. Let's go. We need to be like Abraham. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that you, God, and everything's going to be okay. Was Abraham's life easy when he left? No, man, he ran into a lot of, a lot of issues, a lot of troubles. But it didn't matter because his faith was continuously placed in the God who is sovereign. Our faith is placed in Jesus, the very one who is the same with the Father. I would also add that step out in the midst of your fears and your worries, right? The thing about fear that you guys need to understand is that when, when God is calling you forward, you don't have to say, all right, I'm going to get, I'm, let, me, let me handle this fear. Uh, let, let me tackle this anxiety. No. I would encourage you that with that fear, step out. I would encourage you that with that anxiety, step out. Because guess what's going to happen? When you step out in the midst of your fear, right, with your fear, with your anxiety, who has the power, who has the authority to bring a calmness, a peace to that? Do you know? His name is Jesus. And that is who is before us in this very scripture. The third thing is this, right? Like you want to be used by, by God and you're stepping up. Maybe some of you are stepping up. Maybe some of you are in a place where you are being used by God. You're in a place where you're serving, you're volunteering, you're, you're, you're doing things. And, and I would just want to encourage you this morning, keep trusting God and his word. You, it, you trusted God to step out of your moment, to step out of your chaos. You have to continuously trust God. Just because you're up and you're going doesn't mean you stop. You have to keep your eyes fixated on Jesus. You need to keep your ears and your hearts locked in on the word of God. So in our scripture, right, Peter is doing the unthinkable, right? Jesus has called him out of the boat. He's walking on water. I can't stress this enough. He's doing the thing. He's he, he doing, he doing, he doing the thing. Right? Look, look, at, look at Peter go. Right? He's walking on water. And notice that scripture doesn't mention anything about the storm stopping. Until when? They're back in the boat. All this is taking place in the midst of the chaos of the storm. 
And yet we see the importance, the need to keep trusting Jesus. Because in verse 30 it says what? But when he, referring to Peter, the one walking on the water doing the thing, it says that he saw what? The wind. He saw the wind. And he became afraid. And beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. The storm wasn't a problem when Peter stepped out of the boat. The storm wasn't a problem when Peter was walking on water in the midst of the storm. It's happening simultaneously. It does not cease. It does not stop. Right? The storm wasn't a problem when Peter was trusting Jesus and responding to his command. So when did the storm all of a sudden become a problem? It was when he took his attention off of Jesus and noticed the wind. It wasn't a problem when he was doing the thing, walking on the water, doing the unthinkable, the unimaginable. It was when he took his eyes off of Jesus and looked elsewhere. It became a problem when his faith and his confidence had somehow turned into what? Fear. It's when he began to doubt and trust less. That the storm, the wind became a problem. It's when the storm became a factor and his faith lessened, it decreased. That's when it became a problem. You see, just as we trusted Jesus when we got started, we must continue to trust Jesus as we are going. And believe it or not, man, they're, they're, you're going you're gonna to be met with distractions. You're going to be met with things that are trying to bring you down. Right? It's, it's not like the enemy is going to leave you alone. And say, oh, wow, he, look, he's walking on water, good stuff. No. If anything, the enemy will feel threatened. And he will up his game. He will do everything in his power to distract you, to take your eyes off of Jesus. Because the moment that you take off your, your eyes off of Jesus, guess what happens to you? You become vulnerable. The way that we combat our vulnerability is to keep trusting Jesus and holding tight to his word. You say, however, when we doubt, because it's going to happen, I don't, I don't think any of us is going to be invincible. We're going to have a perfect record or anything like that. But when you doubt, when you get scared, when there are moments or seasons or whatever, like where your faith decreases, like I need you to hear me when I say this. There is grace. You're going to mess up. Let's, let's be honest. Your, your phone's going to go off in the middle of service, Right? You're going to get distracted. Like, let's be honest. But the thing that I need you to remember most is that as you're going in, man, you just mess up, you run into a roadblock, you run into a hiccup, there is grace. Like, you are not going to be met with judgment. Like, God isn't going to punish you and say, man, you silly boy. You're going to insert other adjectives if you like. He's not going to say, like, why are you so, oh, you're so dumb? You're going to get frustrated with you. Because that's not how Jesus responds. Right? In verse 31, as Peter is sinking, take notice to how Jesus reacts. What does Jesus do? It says Jesus immediately does what? He said, peace out, man. <laughs> Enjoy those waters. No. Jesus what? Reaches out his hand. Took hold of him and saying, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Like he's showing him mercy. He's showing him grace. He's meeting him where he is in the midst of his mistake, his mishap. Like he's encountering the grace of God in this very moment. And so for us, like, man, when you mess up, when you encounter, like, uh, like you, you're, like, you're not going to be perfect. I keep mentioning it. As long as you return to Jesus, you will be met with grace. You will be met with mercy. Jesus is there ready to extend his hand and pick you 
up from wherever you're struggling? Do you not see the beauty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning? So in the chance that we do become overtaken with fear or distracted, like you cannot turn away from Jesus. Like don't self like pity yourself, don't self punish yourself, but in the midst of your mistake, in the midst of your mishap, cry out to him saying, Lord, save me, Lord, help me. And guess what's gonna happen? You will be met with his grace. You will be overcome with his mercy. In Psalm 56, 3, it says what? It says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And so church, this morning, guess what you have to do? You have to keep trusting Jesus. You have to stay focused on Jesus and continually trust in his word. Find strength in it. Find comfort in it. Find motivation. Find reassurance. Find security. Find whatever it is that you need to find in him and in him alone. Look nowhere else. In whatever season you're in, whatever you're facing, whatever storm you're in, whatever life decision you're met with, Whatever tribulation has come your way, keep trusting Jesus and his word. Don't be distracted by what is going on around you. Don't be distracted by the noise. Don't be distracted with fear. Be distracted with your faith. Be distracted with, man, I don't know what to do, but trust Jesus. I have no idea what to do except for turn to Jesus. Right, be so distracted with Jesus that nothing else can take your attention off of him. Right, out of all things, right, Peter was scared of the wind. He do, he doing the, the most miraculous thing that a human has ever done. And yet he's distracted by something you can't even see. And let's see you looking at how it's impacting the things around you. Keep trusting Jesus. And his word. The last thing is this. Witness and worship. Witness and worship. And we're going to use this to conclude our time this morning. Because I love how this moment ends. Right? In verse 33, this is what happens. It says, and those in the boat, what do they do? Come on, say it with me. They worshiped him saying, truly you are the Son of God. Right? In the midst of chaos, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of all the, this, these crazy things that are going on, from being the most scared that they have ever been to the most uncertain time of their life, to witnessing Peter doing this mo the most miraculous thing, the end result is what? They worshipped him. They worshipped him. They went from screaming to probably being so tense and turned into worship. Right? They witnessed all, it all unfold from their very own eyes. And it turned into worship. And it's with all that happened. The outcome is what we appreciate most. Those in the boat who didn't display much faith. Who probably weren't trusting God in this very moment, or finding comfort that Jesus was with them. I mean, like, who can blame them? They thought they were seeing a ghost, right? But how this ends is they worshiped. They witnessed, and then they worshiped. The outcome was Jesus being trusted. Right? The outcome was Jesus being glorified. And that's how it should be, right? The thing that I want to share with you with this final point is that not everyone is going to walk on water at the same time. Not everyone's going to walk on water at the same time. Right? God isn't going to be doing the same thing that he's doing in my life and turn around and do this exact same thing in your life. Chances are, like, the things that God is doing in your life and my life are not simultaneously going to happen, but they are for his purpose. Right? Like, let's be clear about that. Like we are all at different stages, different moments, different places in, in our faith and in our lives. But 
as you and I witness the goodness of God working in the lives of others, as you see others stepping out in faith or even learning from their mistakes, would that lead you to worship him? Like you and I, we should celebrate what God is doing in the lives of others. Amen? Like if we see someone like call to repentance, like that should give us even more reason to worship. If we see someone stepping out in faith and making a life change or life decisions, we, we should worship God because of that. If we see a brother who, or sister fall into a mistake, like we shouldn't praise that, right? But we should worship God because we know that God will be known, that God will be glorified even in that situation. The end result is that they witnessed what they witnessed. They saw what they saw. And the outcome was what? Everyone on that boat worships God. Let us witness and with that turn to worship. It is time for you and I to step out of the boat trusting Jesus. It is time for you and I to respond to the authoritative command of come. Or when you see, go. And as we do so, we must walk to Jesus. We must look to Jesus. And we must continuously trust him and his word. Because as you leave here, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be distracted. Or something is going to try to pull you in to distract you, to take your gaze off of Jesus. But we know better. We know that as I leave here, I need to continually look to Jesus and to trust him. Because my faith, because your faith is placed in the one who has come to save. So will you step out of the boat with me and walk to Jesus in the midst of whatever it is you are facing in your life in this moment. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much uh, for this time. God, what a crazy series of events that unfolds with, with Peter and with you present in the middle of the storm. God, I think, I, I, I think you're, you're speaking to so many of us in this room. And so, Father, it's my prayer that as we receive your word, that it would not just fall upon deaf ears, that, God, we would not just hear it and just leave it, but, God, that it would make its way into our hearts, that, God, it would be embedded in the soil and it would plant roots in our lives. God, I pray that it would not be fear that holds us back. God, I pray that it would not be the anxiety or the unknown that prevents us from stepping forward or stepping out from inside the boat. But God, I pray that it would be you and our faith in you that gives us the courage, the confidence to step out in faith and to walk towards you no matter where we might be. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.